First of all, I would like to um, welcome you to this session uh, concerning clinical molecular and nuclear imaging in nanomedicine and precision medicine. I am happy to chair this um, session and I would like to thank, first of all, uh, Beat and uh, Patrick, who did a tremendous work organizing this um, meeting in this really very unusual times uh, of Corona. Um, and um, yeah, I'm happy that I can share now our uh, results from um, the group in Erlangen. So uh, the title, Precision Nanomedicine Using Ionoxid Nanoparticles in Robotics. Um, now, the focus of our group is um, using the supermarketing ionoxid nanoparticles. As you know, um, this can be used in drug delivery or imaging. And um, the really the very um, interesting part of this is that you can manipulate these ionoxid nanoparticles, as you know. And um, what we are doing in Erlang, the CEO, it's the section of experimental ecology and nanomedicine. I do have the chair for nanomedicine here in Erlang since about 11 years now. What you are doing in our uh, research institution, we are synthesizing nanoparticles into the characterization. We are addressing the topic of nanotoxicology, which is really crucial. If you want to go into clinics, you have to address this nanotoxicology part. Then we have the option to do uh, to test and to investigate biological mechanisms. Uh, then we are doing also animal studies. We do have here an um, intervention room. We are doing animal studies by our own. And we do have access to a pharmaceutical uh, synthesis due to um, our um, university uh, pharmacy department uh, to really gain, hopefully, in the future, the option and the aim is to do clinical studies. Now, we have, for this reason, a tremendous um, uh, yeah, amount of uh, infrastructure. We have to have this. I start 20 years or let me say 26 years ago uh, when I started as a physician to do this parallel clinics and research. And um, I got the experience. If you don't have this experience, this uh, knowledge not in your own hand, um, it might be a little bit difficult to do translation. So therefore, we have this infrastructure as seen here in this slide. Now, what we are using the particles is for magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. And why is this so yeah, evident at the moment? Because the normal regular um, application contrast agent in um, materially is gadolinium. Um, but gadolinium has been, um, the evidence is now that it's concentrated in different organs, for example, in the brain and also in other tissues. And uh, the EMA, which uh, formerly was located in London, now in Amsterdam, claimed that the linear um, gadolinium is not uh, um, more permitted to be applied in, in human beings. It's only the, the cycle um, 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 gadolinium. And therefore, I think that iron oxide nanoparticle, not only I, I think iron oxide nanoparticle, which are previously used in medicine for contrast agent and MRI, might be a really um, um, a good option for uh, uh, some uh, indications in in medicine and what we are doing is that um, if you are applying these particles you do have uh, different contrast you don't have a uh, white contrast you have a dark contrast and this is something which we would like to implement into clinics in the future because you see here on this slide we did this uh, prior pilot experiments in liver of uh, mouse if you do inject them intravenously after one hour you do have a totally uh, signal distinction in the liver and after around 24 hours, then you have um, um, a re restructured uh, of the liver. So you can see the, um, the liver in a normal um, visualization. And this is something we would like to address with our nanoparticles, the CO spire index, to address, um, for example, um, illnesses or diseases of the liver in, in the first uh, glance. Uh, another um, application for research mode is uh, in vivo application pilot studies in arteriosclerotic blocks, um, where you can see here, um, it is, um, we did these experiments in rabbits um, suffering from um, plaques, which are uh, uh, produced to a Western diet. And you can see here that uh, iron oxide nanoparticles can be um, really concentrated in these plaques and can be um, uh, as a diagnostic tool for um, physicians in the future. Drug targeting, as I mentioned before, is something what we are um, starting with. Uh, we do a synthesizing our particles. They are coated with biocompatible layer and then um, chemotherapy agent is 
concentrate or is attached to these particles, we do place them intraturally in tumor bearing rabbits. And this compound is then concentrated via an ex external magnetic field into uh, the tumor tissue. Um, here, uh, again, seeing that we can concentrate this after intraarterial injection. And what we could gain after this is that if we have um, with only 10% of the regular systemic dose um, bound to the particles up to 60% concentrated um, chemotherapeutic agent in the tumor region compared to um, less than 1% after the regular application of um, intravenous application of 100% of the regular systemic dose. That means if you do apply our particles bound to only 10% of the regular systemic dose, we can have a much higher uh, concentration dose in the respective tumor tissue. Um, this is the visualization. If you do this magnetic drug targeting, uh, intraterial drug targeting, we have here up to, let me say, to 10 to 11 weeks, a complete in, um, tumor reduction and um, uh, no tumor was visible uh, for the uh, observation period. Another very new um, tool we are addressing at the moment is magnetically controlled immune therapy. What we are doing is the following. Immune therapy is a very uh, modern at the moment, but uh, what we have learned from clinics is that it's also associated with adverse side effects. What we are trying to do is the following, that we would like to use these T cells um, and uh, in these T-cells, spions are incorporated. Then you have a T-cell hybrid, which is manipulative, um, which can be manipulated with external magnetic fields. Um, and um, you can see here this, um, this scheme, um, shown in this scheme. And um, what we have we are seen in our group is um, due to the fact that we can synthesize these particles by our own, it's really essential to have really the option how to um, uh, synthesize the particles, and especially to cover um, the, the surface. And what we found in this case is that citrate is the best option to really have um, the fulfillment of particles which are high compatible on the one side, a good uptake in T cells, and a good magnetic control. And as you can see here on the right side, this uh, tel T cell hybrids can be manipulated with external magnetic fields. So this is um, an other um, uh, option to do, and uh, another um, uh, uh, other project we are addressing is tissue engineering. I'm um, from my physician. I'm a ENT, ear, nose, and throat physician, and um, often in um, larynx processes, like you can see here, uh, of the glottic area. This is a cancer. If you do a um, resection of a cancer, you do have a tissue deficit. And this is causing hoarseness, and many people are, cannot follow anymore their job. So therefore, you have to do something, an individual replacement of the tissue you extracted. And what we are doing in the following is, is uh, comparable to the T cell, to the immunology. We are incorporating nanoparticles into fibroblast or vocal cord cells. And um, what we are doing externally, what we are trying to do is, with external magnetic field, we create a 3D uh, cell structure, and in the future, we hope that we can re replace the uh, deficit um, in the organ with this uh, 3D construct um, cell hybrids. You can see here uptake of the particles in the fibroblast or vocal cord cell is possible, and um, this is um, essential to do have the, out, uh, the outreach to replace individually and precisely uh, the uh, tissue deficit, which is created for um, in terms of, of surgery, for example. Um, now, the last part, since we are running out of time a little bit, um, as I mentioned before, we do it for own operation theater with an angiography, which is necessary to really declare in advance the vascular supply of cancer to have an appropriate knowledge about the vascular supply of this cancer. And what you see here is an electromagnet, which is statically fixed on this, um, uh, on this um, uh, construct. And um, now, since several months recently, we established a robot in our operations theater, which enables us to really move the magnetic um, uh, field very precisely and um, in different body regions. And this is our start now um, with this new application mode to not only produce nanoparticles for different applications in medicine and the other side also to have 
the precise magnetic field to really control the application of the particles. Taken together, sum up is spines offer, as I mentioned before, a variety of applications in biomedicine, MRI magnetic truck targeting, um, magnetic tissue engineering, robotics will improve the application. And we, are, um, we know this or we hope this, and hopefully in the future, we will show you this in the next cleanup, hopefully in person, in Basel again, and um, the translation to have really precision nanomedicine from the magnetic field of view. And uh, the translation into clinics is mandatory and uh, concrete in this term, I think, from our standpoint of view. But to have this translation, um, as, you, as everybody knows, of course, is financial support is, is necessary to have really the option to transfer this into clinical trials for the better of the patient. I would like to thank all the funding organization and uh, of course my team, because without my team, I couldn't do the work. So thank you very much for your audience. Yeah, I would like to uh, go to the next topic. The next topic is um, from Professor Beatrice Beck-Schimmer. She is um, professor uh, for anesthesiology in the University of Zurich, beautiful city. And she is talking today about biomedical biochemical functionality of magnetic particles as nanosensors. How far away are we um, clinical practice? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Christoph, for this nice introduction. And thanks a lot for having me here. I know it's a, it's a, a difficult time. And I would like to uh, thank all the organizers. It's really great that we can have this uh, meeting. Okay, I, uh, I think this is not uh, so important. I would like to guide you through a little bit in general, you know, what, what, it, what do we have in terms of publications? What do we have already as clinical applications for na na nanoparticles, magnetic particles? And, and then particularly highlight um, the risks, you know, this is very important, I think, uh, for patients, but also for us as uh, clinicians. And um, let's see, I mean, when we have a look at publications, you see here on the x-axis over time, the increase of publications, the percent of part articles worldwide. And we also have in parallel uh, a lot of patents. So the questions is, of course, here you see, it depends a little bit on, on the country, the share of uh, nanopart uh, patents. But the question is, where are we with the clinical application? So this means we publish a lot. And of course, uh, we all like that. And I think the, some of, of these publications are excellent. But let's have a look at the real applications so that we can really translate our findings into a clinical scenario. So theoretically, when we talk about magnetic nanoparticles, there are many possible scenarios. So in terms of uh, diagnostic application, uh, therapeutic application, I don't go into details, or both together, such as seronostic applications. And as you can see here, we already heard a little bit from Christoph. Um, we just focus here on spion, um, on special nanoparticles. You can see here for diagnosis, there are already on the market, some of these uh, particles for detection of biomarkers, cytokines during inflammation or cancer markers. Um, but we also have for therapies, we have uh, uh, iron therapy and we have some particles which are used for uh, treatment of bioblastoma. But we also have, as you can see here, uh, phase two, three or one studies. Now, I would like to refer to one example from our lab. And I think for me, this is very important to see, you know, how we can develop such magnetic nanosensors or particles. So we started here in collaboration with uh, the ETH, with uh, Wendelin Stark's team to produce or they produce through flame spray synthesis, magnetic nanoparticles, first iron particles, and then we switched to cobalt. And then we coated them with uh, interleukin-6 antibodies, just to, to try to figure out if we can catch interleukin-6 uh, if we contaminate our own blood. I may be a little bit pale because we, we give a lot of blood uh, for our own tests. And you can see here, we, we try with, with the magnet to, to um, purify the blood from interleukin-6. And this looks like this here with increasing concentrations 
of um, interleukin-6 antibody coated nano uh, magnets, we have a decrease of interleukin-6. Just as a small example, and when we try to um, perform a similar study in vivo in, in rats, here we took the example of uh, digoxin. Digoxin is a cardiac medication. So we uh, used antibodies against digoxin, and we used a kind of dialysis system where we had uh, a kind of intoxication with digoxin for the animal. Uh, and then we injected the coated nanoparticles, and here we extracted them through a magnetic separation and redirected the purified blood to the animal. And as you can see here, um, without uh, nanomagnets here, the, the circles, the white circles versus here when we have um, degussy specific nanomagnets over time. So this um, experiments look, look very promising, but on the other side, I think we also have to try to figure out what kind of possible risk we have. And when we have a look at the vessel, we see here we have the blood coagulation, we have possible inflammatory reactions, and um, we may also have an uptake of particles, which we, of course, don't like, or maybe it's not important. Let's see. So the first um, evaluation here, you see, we try to figure out over time, um, if, we, if we try to start a, a clotting, you can see here versus the control here to the very right, we have a little bit the faster initiation of the clot forming, um, maybe five or eight percent. So the question is if, if this is clinically relevant, if we use our uh, nanoparticles. In terms of inflammation, here on the left side, we could not see any differences if we have a, just a control with saline or we use, uh, uh, expose the blood to our nanoparticles. And if we uh, induce shear stress, it was evident that with increased shear stress, with increased flow, we have less particles uh, in, in endothelial cells. And of course, um, it's very important if we have an inflammation that could be a potential problem, then we have an increase of uh, nanoparticles within the cell. Most importantly, I think this is a one year study in mice. We, we uh, in, injected a lot of nanoparticles uh, into mice and we observed the mice uh, after one year, and you can see here, we could not find any inflammation, no fibrosis, no necrosis, and no tumor. So that's very promising, but we also have to face regulatory challenge. I don't go into details, just um, to highlight that. I think it's very important. Don't forget that nanoparticles are uh, a kind of new uh, category, new materials, so we, knew, we need new categorization, new rules and uh, all the biological properties, safety issues, ethical and legal aspects we have uh, to take in, into uh, consideration. And finally, and I think this is a very important message and I close with that. And I, I realized, Christoph, you were uh, starting with the Seon Circle. You see, can see here the WIS uh, Zurich Translational Center and some of the projects which are funded by the center, like Hemotune. Hemotune is a, is a company which is now in charge to, to come to an end, to bring these nanoparticles, this purification system. They have a, a sepsis model. They try to tackle cytokines. And I think this is very important, you know, so that's their model. You remember the model we had, uh, I showed you. And we are very delighted to see them. And one of my take home messages is, of course, we can design uh, and perform studies, design new materials, perform uh, studies. But at the end, you know, when we have uh, thrilling results, we should really try to translate them. And uh, this is like the Seon uh, circle. I think we should really bring, as you showed, Christoph, uh, our uh, findings from the bench invention to a bedside product. And I would like to close with that and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Excellent talk.
And I'm really happy because, you know, 2008, I had a call to the university hospital in Zurich. And I, there at the time, I had a, 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 a proposal made in Nanomedicine Zurich together with university hospital in, in ETH. Uh, so maybe we can restart this again. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Call me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. So um, I would like now to go to the next talk from Dr. Natalie Minier. Um, Natalie Minier is um, working as a research director at the National Cancer, the National Center of Science uh, Research in France. And she is giving today the talk concerning biomedical function, no, the talk about personal medicine for renal dysfunction using silver nanoparticles. Yeah, thank you, Christoph. Uh, okay, you can hear me? Okay, so um, I wanted to talk about this small nanoparticle. It was more in, uh, so we're getting back to gadolinium agents now. Um, and it was in a dysfunction of the red kidney, which is uh, not so often studied. Um, so, yes. Okay, so it's about chronic uh, kidney disease also called CKD, and the CKD is, uh, is a high incidence and prevalence due to uh, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and population aging. Uh, and it will go to renal fibrosis uh, if we let them go in, which will decrease the glomerular filtration rate, uh, which will lead to chronic kidney failure, and then finally severe kidney failure, which then needs di dialysis and, uh, and expensive uh, treatments. So the idea is to try to uh, have an early diagnosis of the renal dysfunction. And currently, um, there are not so many uh, um, agents. So the measurement of the glomerular filtration rate is made with albumin, as you know, or creatinine. So these are quite indirect uh, and high uh, variable uh, markers. And there are some imaging methods, of, uh, of course, which are uh, currently unspecific, but uh, based on uh, CT scan or ultrasound and MRI. Um, so the idea is to get a, a, a better tool uh, to predict earlier renal dysfunction. Uh, so we were interested with these uh, nanoparticles that you might have heard about before. Uh, François Lux has presented them in the clinical trials for uh, radiosensitizing agents. There are three nanometer nanoparticles, and which is interesting, they have gadolinium. They have 10 gadolinium per particle. So they're very well, well characterized uh, and they are eliminated by the kidney. So you can see uh, down on the, the optical imaging or here uh, with PET imaging or optical imaging. It goes mostly in the cortex, uh, if you see the gadolinium here. And due to its um, 10 gadolinium per particle, it is a very good contrast agent for MRI. So the large scale production has been already performed because it uh, was tested on um, clinical try on glioblastoma as radiosensitizing agent. So the phase one was completed and there were no sign of toxicity and the phase two is ongoing. So uh, therefore we're quite interested in this particle, which are developed right now by the company NH Theoretics. So what we do expect uh, if we work, go back to um, CKD on coronal dysfunction, when you have this kidney dysfunction, you will have a reduced number of nephron. Um, and so uh, a reduced uh, accumulation of uh, the, the the compounds to be eliminated, uh, filtrated. So you will have, in terms of signal, a diminution of the signal. If we uh, would use Agix nanoparticle, they would be uh, a little bigger than the dodorem, for instance, which were, uh, was, was a control, which is very well filtrate, filtered by the, the kidney. So uh, we started with uh, an acute renal failure to see if we would see any uh, difference um, with the kidney would be the control and the other one would be obstructed and follow the kinetic of signal enhancement. So if you see here on the, the image, uh, one is the control, the other one is uh, the, the obstructed kidney. There are not so many differences with Dotorem and there are quite different with Agix. And if we quantify the signal particularly in the cortex, we can see that we have a high signal of the, the agix nanoparticle 
first with a, a reduced amount of catalinium on the same mice. And on a, the obstructed mice, you can see that there's no so much difference uh, with the commercial agent, while you have quite a, a large difference of the kinetic and the uptake uh, for the disease kinase as regard to the non-disease kinase. So this is an inaccurate model, and we also label the particles by optical imaging with a cyanine 5 to follow them. Um, and we can see here the similar uh, kinetic with accumulation in both kidney, but if you have um, an obstructed kidney, then you can see that there's no accumulation in the obstructed kidney. So uh, for the acute model, uh, it was quite clear, but then we chose to evaluate an induction with folic acid, which would relate, reflects more the uh, impact of a chronic disease, a kidney disease. It's a, a smaller um, uh, um, effect on the kidney. And here you can see with the agates nanoparticle that you have this a significant difference in the uptake of uh, the agent. And uh, we were, the company Galapagos is uh, developing treatments for this um, fibrosis. And with the treatment, you can see that it's almost getting back to the normal using this agent. So for them, it will be very interesting to have this type of companion uh, diagnostic agent to follow the treatment uh, of uh, their development. Um, so uh, at the cellular level, you can see that basically uh, the nanoparticle are mostly go into the tubular level, meaning that there's not so only an elimination, a fast elimination of the glomerular filtration rate as the small molecules, but probably a resorption and tubular excretion. So this is what we are interested in now, trying to um, see which disease and a particular tubular affected disease would benefit uh, from this agent. So thank you. All the teams, the NH Teradix is the company developing this nanoparticle if you're interested in them. And Galapagos is the company developing agents for uh, the treatment of kidney fibrosis. And uh, my team, thank you. So, Natalie, thank you very much for this really interesting talk. Um, so I think we go to the next one. Um, the next speaker is Enza Torino. She is um, graduated in chemical engineering from the University of Salerno. And uh, I was really happy about to hear that you were a guest scientist also in Erlangen at the SAOT. And I'm really happy to hear your talk concerning nanoplatforms for the design of engineered biopolymer nanostructures for therapy in multimodal imaging applications. Okay, thank you for, um, for being here. Thank you for the participation to this uh, session. I will talk about uh, uh, nanoplatform for the design of engineering biopolymer nanostructures. Uh, I want to start from a uh, make a clinical point. I heard in the previous uh, uh, from the previous speaker that we are all moving to to translate our uh, um, our system, our uh, let's say knowledge, our expertise, our product to the clinical practice. And this is extremely important important when you are talking about a diagnostic devices. Uh, indeed, the no one expect to be damaged by a diagnostic device. Since you are using a diagnostic device to make a, a, a diagnosis, you, you, you want to be, I mean, you, you hope to be, uh, to be healthy. And above all, no one is expecting to be damaged by, uh, by the MRI, by the injection of such gadolinium-based contrast agents, so by the injection of these liquid metals in the, in, in the human body. Um, but we must say that almost 60% uh, of the patients that are injected with gadolinium, they have experienced documented new or worsening symptoms. But the numbers are much more. Indeed, uh, um, it is a recent uh, publication published on current problems in diagnostic radiology. It is a publication in, uh, from 2020 was uh, um, uh, was reporting that the 50-80% of radiologists admitted they uh, were not including the gadolinium toxicity, the gadolinium de deposition in their report to avoid, to avoid the so-called scantiety. Scantiety is, uh, is, I mean, a feeling that the, the patients um, have waiting for the MRI. Okay, waiting for the MRI or waiting maybe of a toxicity that, that, that can be 
produced by the MRI. So they are avoiding to tell the patient, they are avoiding, avoiding to report may, maybe symptoms uh, due to the MRI. And so the patients, uh, most of the patients, this is a very common problem in US since uh, uh, many community of, um, communities of patients were born. So they are entering the so-called never-ending loop of gadolinium uh, poisoning. And these, uh, even only one injection of the, this gadolinium-based contrast agent can have long life, long life effect. So the problem is so huge. And we already heard about uh, uh, nephrotoxicity. We were discussing this in the previous presentation about renal dysfunction. So we know about nephrotoxicity. We know that the, 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 um, um, the imaging properties of the, the gadolinium, of the current approved gadolinium, they are not enough. Uh, we know that they, are, uh, they can give also heavy allergic effects. And recently, the FDA and the, and the MA, so the Food and Drug Administration and the European Medicine Agency, alarm the medical community about the risks of the gadolinium de deposition in the brain just only after one MRI and suspended four of nine gadolinium uh, from the market. Now, uh, starting by the, uh, the way that the gadolinium uh, approved, clinically approved gadolinium work, so this uh, uh, metal compound plus a, a macromolecules that is uh, uh, protecting um, uh, the transmetallization of gadolinium in the body. So starting by the, the basic uh, knowledge of gadolinium, so uh, the most common theoretical aspect of the gadolinium are analyzed by the Solomon Blomber theory. Starting by this consideration and understanding about the corre uh, characteristic correlation time of gadolinium, uh, several sci scientists have uh, produced um, uh, some strategies, let's say, to improve this, uh, this relaxivity. Uh, Port started uh, more than 10 years ago with the rigidification that was uh, just a, a very a simple conjugation of the molecules to, the, to, to, to a polymer in order to improve, to reduce, let's say, the mobility of such molecules. Then a more recent, a more recent study were, uh, were published by um, the Cuzzi, talking about a geometrical confinement. He was using uh, a microparticles with nanopores to, uh, to confine geometrically such a, a macromolecules, so liquid metals, so the gadolinium basic contrast agent in the nanopores. And then there are other, other um, eff effective uh, strategies. We saw uh, the previous presentation too, that was a conjugation of the gadolinium ion to some, some polymers. So Port, uh, Kuran, De Kuzzi, and, and Zhang, uh, uh, strategies to boost the relaxivity, relaxivity, so to use a, a lower dosage, but to improve the quality of images. We recently, as a group, we proposed a new concept that we called hydrodenticity. And it consists in, the, in the, uh, avoiding the modification of the gadolinium-based contrast agents as approved in the clinical practice. But we are using hydrogel polymers, so all the hydrogel polymers that you can I mean, find on the market to, to adjust, to control the characteristic correlation time of the gadolinium-based contrast agent. So we are not modifying the clinical approved uh, molecules, but we are using hydrogel to control the properties of such molecules. That's extremely important for the translation we were discussing before, because we are combining some products without changing the chemistry, but changing, changing the properties, the physical properties. So we have to, we can maybe, uh, we can say that we can shortcut the regulatory pathway. And it, it is a reality. It's not something that is, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a perspective. So we, uh, um, uh, we, uh, we thought, we hypothesized, and we studied that this uh, control of the structural parameter was due to the formation of such a GADO mesh. So we all know that hydrogel has some polymer meshes, so some, some specific structures. And these structures are changed. Uh, there is a mutual change, let's say, of the structures due to the presence of the gadolinium. So the gadolinium is adjusting the mesh. And the mesh is interacting with the gadolinium, creating some, some condition, some equilibrium, some, a, a new equilibrium that is uh, uh, considering osmotic pressure, elastodynamic forces, hydration of the polymer matrix. 
we study such a problem in the back, not only in a nanostructures, so it was a concept that we wanted to implement as a basic understanding. So we study, study such a, a problem in the, in the bulk, uh, starting uh, by the rheological properties of the polymer, how the gadolinium can change such a rheological problem. We study um, um, these properties by um, uh, calorimetry to understanding about the energetic contribution that the gadolinium was given to the matrix and that the matrix was given to the gadolinium without any chemical modification, don't forget that. And we found that this contribution was due only at specific ratio. So was a, a change in properties, was a change in the environment that was uh, um, uh, hosting the gadolinium basic contrast agent. This was analyzed uh, by nuclear magnetic resonance imaging and uh, studied by, uh, I mean, uh, even by other differential uh, calorimetry technique and analyzed, of course, by uh, uh, MRI. MRI in benchtop, relaxometer, 1.5 Tesla, um, 3 Tesla, uh, PET MRI, 9.4 Tesla, and also studying the Larmor, um, uh, the frequency, uh, Larmor, uh, sorry, the proton uh, Larmor frequency, okay, to understand the role of protons in the uh, formation of uh, these new structures. So to make um, a long story uh, short, we were uh, through the structural parameters of the other, changing the structural parameters of the others, we were able to control the relaxivity. As you can see here, here you can see the relaxivity on the uh, y-axis and uh, uh, instead the gadolinium concentration on the on the on the x in the in the on the x-axis uh, axis, and so we get, we got a, a strong improvement. So that's I also showed was in the bulk. We call this concept uh, concept gadolinium, and I, as I said, controlling the characteristic correlation time. So we started to implement implement uh, such a uh, condition, hydrodentity condition, in uh, um, many uh, uh, nano nano medical architectures, nano medicine architectures, using different platforms. So we were not interested in defining one system or one method. We we were uh, uh, scratching all the <coughs> sorry, we were screening all the all the system, at applying to diff the, this, uh, this uh, concept to different architecture, to different platforms. We patented the semi semi several technology, or this that we call the functional encapsulation, and we, uh, we test uh, that, this is an example of a microfluidic platform, we apply that to Pitocin, PSA, HA, hyaluronic acid, PLA, Dextran, PLA, PG, and so on was tested in vivo when we observed the biodistribution and we saw that we were able to uh, to reduce the dosage up to 10 times obtaining the same uh, MRI uh, signal in in, in uh, mouse we used uh, uh, this uh, system not only for the MRI but for multimodal so MRI plus fluorescence by fluorescence uh, molecular tomography plus heteranostic approach since was used for the treatment of a cell B lymphoma and analyzed the, the, the reduction of the tumor. Uh, the same approach of hydrodenticity with another architecture, so with another system was also applied for the treatment of the uh, brain tumor and the results are uh, unpublished and are current, currently under investigation through intravital macroscopy. So we are observing how the tumor is changing. And was also applied for the, the diagnosis and treatment of a um, so still heteranostic approach uh, for a cardiovascular disease to control the inflammatory aspect of the human atherosclerotic plaques through the use in a uh, specific biopolymer and a specific antibody, CD36. So a plenty of architecture, a plenty of nano shuttles, uh, a plenty of nano shuttles uh, using the hydrodenticity, but implemented for the treatment of many pathology. So uh, these are only some of the, co the, the collaboration I showed today. And uh, thank you for your attention. I, I hope I was uh, on time. I'm not sure, but uh, thank you anyway for your attention. If you have any question or uh, curiosity, please just uh, ask now or contact me. Uh, ever. We have also a um, certain company that are uh, producing and uh, developing and uh, um, um, testing such a uh, architecture system. Thank you.
So, and so thank, you, thank you very much for this really um, interesting and actual talk. Um, we uh, move now to the next speaker. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Vladimir Lyubimov. Um, he is um, um, an MD um, in the fourth year of neurosurgery at the Cedar Sinai Medical Center. And um, he is interested in neuro-oncology. And um, he is talking today about polymeric nanoconjugates for MRI brain tumor differential imaging and treatment. Thank Welcome. you very much for a <clears throat> wonderful introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak at your conference. Um, <clears throat> I'm very sad that I was not able to visit your beautiful city uh, this year, but hopefully next year in less uncertain times. <clears throat> so today I'll be talking about our nanoconjugates for uh, imaging and treatment, and uh, our personalized medicine approach. So. Without further ado, I will begin. Uh, these are our disclosures. So basically today we'd like to talk about um, what we call an MRI virtual biopsy. It's a technology where we can use modular nano agents for multiple purposes. We can use it for precise imaging diagnosis. And afterwards, we can modulate it to treat the same uh, disease it diagnosed and then further use the to monitor the effic efficacy of our treatment, kind of culminating what we call the nano clinic in the brain. <clears throat> So one case we interest, uh, uh, would like to show is that uh, here's a conventional MRI for diagnosis. This is a 48-year-old uh, female patient with metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer with um, metastasis to the brain. As you see, she has multiple areas of enhancement throughout her brain. Um, and uh, <clears throat> although we, it's these lesions, we are not for 100% certain what these lesions are. Clinically, we can assume these are metastases, uh, but they can be many other things as they look similar to infections, other tumors, radiation necrosis, and so forth. Um, so, and uh, unfortunately, this patient uh, passed away, and on autopsy, it was revealed that she had three different pathologies in her brain. She had uh, metastasis, she had radiation necrosis from her radiation treatment, and she had an abscess. So, um, without some sort of uh, biopsy, we would not be able to tell that. So today, uh, for at least in many cancers in, uh, in the brain, especially, the gold standard for diagnosis is ultimately a surgical biopsy. And the most minimally invasive is something called a stereotactic needle uh, biopsy. But no matter how you call it, it's still a surgery, which is invasive and has uh, its complications. And that can be either from anesthesia, from the surgical procedure itself, from the hospital stay, and the, one of the largest uh, case series um, looked at over uh, 7,500 cases and showed that the overall complication rate was 6.1%. The mortality approach is almost 3% from these surgical procedures. And in significant amount of cases, it was non-diagnostic, such as because the lesion can be small and the needle can miss. Um, and also, especially in the brain, there are areas where it's not safe to do a biopsy in more eloquent areas like the brainstem. So <clears throat> with that, this is where our technology comes in. Uh, we have engineered a novel class of um, nanomedical imaging agents with bound gadolinium to it, uh, and also treatment drugs. And they have the ability to pass through the blood-brain barrier the, uh, intact via receptor-mediated transcytosis. They can target cancer cells for efficient and precise MRI diagnostics and deliver nanodrugs for treatment. Now. Um, here we show a kind of model how it uses transcytosis to cross the blood-brain barrier intact and then bind specific tumors. And here we show a double uh, tumor mouse model. We, in the same animal, we implanted two different types of tumors intracranially, one um, in each hemisphere with different surface markers. We then, um, in one hemisphere, we had an EGFR positive tumor. And then we uh, equivalently attached to tuximab an antibody, which targets EGFR and uh, injected intravenously. This allowed us uh, to specifically enhance only the EGFR positive tumor, while the HER2 positive tumor uh, was relatively significantly more uh, isointense to the brain tissue. The following day in the exact same animal, we uh, were injected now the HER2 positive um, uh, tracer with uh, a trastuzumab antibody covalent attached to it. And it only lit up the HER2 tumor while the EGFR tumor was silent. 
And this allows us to be very selective in what we, would, we can image. Now here is a larger schematic of our um, targeting agent. Now we're showing the HER2 uh, targeting nanoimaging agent. As you can see, with uh, time injection, uh, the, only the HER2 positive tumor start, remains uh, enhancing. And this is enhancement per, uh, persists for over three hours. And then further, we confirm on cytology that we only used the, uh, we only were able to enhance the HER2 uh, positive tumor, not the EGFR positive tumor in these double tumor mo models. And in the same animals, we are able to inject a, a subsequent EGFR positive uh, nanoimaging agent uh, to target only the EGFR positive tumors. So we are able to completely dis differentiate in the same series of animals two different tumors uh, on, the diff on different days of injection. Now, <clears throat> uh, after precise uh, diagnostics, uh, we can easily modify our technology to do treatment of the disease. Uh, so with animals with these inoculated brain tumors are injected with our drug um, for treatment now, uh, and we check for survival. Um, our drug basically works, like I said previously, for, through tr uh, receptor-mediated transcytosis across the blood-brain barrier. But now it can also has uh, other modalities to be uh, target a specific tumor cell and also be able to enter it intracellularly, where the tumor cell digests this uh, and causes release of our therapeutic agents, such as antisense oligonucleotides to block uh, tumor protein synthesis and thus specifically kill the tumor cell. And here is our treatment. Um, uh, we increase significantly the survival of animals with um, HER2-positive breast cancer uh, brain metastasis models, as well as triple negative uh, breast cancer and lung cancer that were EGFR positive. And we showed, again, significant survival increase with our medication, as well as a significant elimination of tumor cells, as shown by histology and protein analysis. Now, the next step to evolve our technology, we switched from antibody targeting to peptide targeting for more efficient treatment. And this significantly makes our polymer smaller from 22 nanometers to seven nanometers. And this gives us these, creates what we call the mini nano, uh, nano imaging agents. And advantages include better penetration, faster diffusion, improved uptake, simpler synthesis, and decreased cost of production. Here's one of the peptides that we use. It's called the NGOPEP2, which recognizes endothelial low density lipoprotein related protein one. And this peptide essentially is uh, helping us with receptor-mediated transcytosis, similar to its uh, tr uh, transferrin antibody counterpart, and allows us to take our uh, nanoimaging agent and therapeutic agents across the blood-brain barrier completely intact. And then here we show a schematic of our uh, mini nanocontrast agents with different length of the polymalic acid scaffold. Uh, we classify them to low molecular weight and the higher molecular weight um, nanoimaging agents. And then here we show um, our efficacy of the mini nanoconjugate uh, in tumor uptake with the high molecular weight being the more effective drug overall and showing much uh, significantly higher uh, tumor enhancement, similar to the original antibody uh, system. And then just like the, our uh, treatment modification, these mini uh, nano imaging agents can be easily modified to now deliver not only imaging, but also therapeutics. And here we demonstrate a um, conjugate that delivers uh, checkpoint inhibitors, uh, PD-1 and CTLA-4, uh, to uh, mice with uh, intracranial glioma. Uh, with the, and this, our treatment shows significant survival benefits. So with this, we essentially created a nanoclinic um, in the brain. We have um, precise imaging diagnosis, what we call the MRI virtual biopsy. We're able to uh, visualize this tumor of interest specifically. And after that, we can easily modify this same uh, drug conjugates to now deliver effective specific treatment. And we can tailor make this for every patient uh, depending on their pathology, which uh, gives us the uh, theranostic approach and the personalized medicine approach. So with that, thank you very much for uh, your attention, and I'd like to thank my wonderful team who has taught me so much over the years and let me participate in this very interesting and significant research that we hope to bring this to clinical trials. So, thank you. 
Oh, Gladme, thank you very much for this really interesting talk and uh, showing the future, hopefully. Patients will uh, benefit from this. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now we will turn to the next speaker. And the next speaker is Ashis Avasti. Uh, he was in the uh, last, uh, yeah, told me that uh, you wanted to participate. Um, Ashi Avasti is, um, by, uh, is a stage researcher in the Bio and in Malaga, Spain. And he is talking about scalability and reproducibility of iron oxide nanoparticles revisited and upgraded for use in nanomedicine. Aziz, just go ahead. So, hi and good afternoon to everyone. First of all, thanks for this, thanks for this opportunity. I feel very nervous presenting in front of such esteemed speakers. I'm a PhD student here in Malaga, Spain. And today my talk focuses on scalability and reproducibility of iron oxide nanoparticles. And so why is scalability and reproducibility important? The, the main goal of nanomedicine is to go from bench to bedside. So for that's why reproducibility and scalability is important. And this image shows that. So let's consider four hypothetical reactions and the first time you do the reaction, you get great, decent results in terms of size, shape, and monodispersity. But when you try to reproduce them, the percentage goes down. And it goes down even further when you try to scale them up. So which one would you produce as, a, an, as an industry and which one would you buy as, an, as a user? So, so, so most of these are not viable except one. But if you're a user, end user like me, who, is, who wants the best product at, at the cheapest price, you'd want to produce re reaction two, but at a much lower cost. So this is what we're trying to do to, with this talk. We're trying to manipulate iron oxide nanoparticles and see if we are able to do them. So for this, the R studies, we use thermal decomposition method. It was based on the choice because it produces highly monodispersed nanoparticles. And we use two of the most common precursors, iron oleate and iron acetylestonate with, with different solvents. So the, these solvents were chosen because, because of the way each reaction proceeds. So that's why they are particular reaction was used with different solvents. Then we varied such uh, these parameters, such as ramp rates, time of the reaction, stirring speed, precursor, etc. And this slide shows the effect of ramp rate on size. Now, before I tell about these graphs, now literature suggests that size is inversely proportional to the ramp rate. So if it means if you increase the ramp rate, the size is supposed to decrease. However, and if you decrease the ramp rate, size is supposed to increase. But our study suggests that that's not always true. Because if you see, there's a certain uh, limit with which, in which the, it follows that, that uh, trend. Uh, beyond that, it does not really follow the trend. Particularly if you see at the lower ramp rate, the size of the nanoparticles becomes highly solvent dependent. So we further tried to see what part of the reaction, nucleation or growth, does the size depend on? And this is just the data for iron oleate and octadecene reactions. And we could not really see much difference because, and it would suggest that ramp rate is not one of the important factors on which the size of the nanoparticles depend on. And then we changed, the, varied the time of the reaction, aging time. So with when the reaction was done with hexadecene, you could see that up to 30 minutes, the particles are not formed. But at, at six, it needed 60 minutes to actually form the particles. But with octadecene, in five minutes, the particles were formed and the, at the same size uh, what we saw in the end. Next, the, we saw compared the size and solvent. So in this gra uh, graph, you see that different solvents are compared to the different size they give. These sizes are based on the monodispersity as well as homogeneity that we get from these particles and reproducibility as well. So ideally, octadecene, if you want the particles from eight to 10 nanometers, you would use octadecene as a solvent while hexadecene for lower, benzalether for even lower, and diphenylether for even lower. This study holds true. It's, it's supported by the literature as well because literature suggests that the boiling point of the solvent is important because 
the, because it limits the growth of the particle. So lower the boiling point, lower would be the size of the nanoparticles that we get, which we which the trend follows. So these are the results. Some of the results we got with octadecene by varying different parameters. So in the first four images, you see that all the parameters were same and the size we got were more or less similar. Then we changed the ramp rate and we still got similar nanoparticles. Then we changed the iron oleate concentration. The size was still more or less similar. And then in these three images, we decreased the ramp rate. The size increased, but with high polydispersity. And in the last four images, our, and that is our attempt to scale up these, these reactions up to five times. And most of them seem to have failed because, because of the polydispersity. We wanted monodispersity here. Similarly, we did other studies with hexadecene. I'm not going to explain these, uh, benzyl ether, phenyl ether, and olyl alcohol as a co-solvent. Now, this, this study was particularly important because this gave us an idea because olyl alcohol is is a solvent which can reduce the, reduce the temperature of existing solvent, addition of olyl alcohol to the reaction. And it is also a co-surfactant. So we played, with, played, played around with other parameters and found out that when you add two different surfactants in addition to olyl alcohol, you can actually control the size, very highly, which is highly reproducible as well as scalable. So if you see A and B, they are similar reactions while C is the scaled up reaction. If you, increase, if you increase the stirring speed, you can go down to even two nanometer particles, which are very monodispersed, which would be very interesting for the applications such as brain tumors because of, because of the size, size importance in there to cross the blood brain barrier. And these are the XRD characterization of all the, some of the nanoparticles that we made using different protocols. And they all suggest the particles were iron oxide indeed. And here we have reproducibility and scalability as a factor of precursor and solvent. So in the first image, if you see, there are percentage reproducibility based on different precursor and solvent. So the highest one is the one we suggested by the addition of olyl alcohol and two different surfactants, while others are a bit low. We only considered the, uh, the reaction in which we got results which were actually slightly monodispersed and monodispersed. We did not consider polydispersed nanoparticles here. And in this image, we, we, it's the scalability and reproducibility both together in terms of precursor and solvent. So here, if you see the R particles shows pretty high scalability and reproducibility for a size of four nanometer. Which is which is followed closely second by iron oleate and hexadecene, while others falter in scalability basically generally. So they're not really scale scalable. At least we couldn't do it if they are. And since these particles were supposed to be used in mice, which were mice tumors, which are going to be viewed using MRI, we did relaxivity studies, and as expected, the both hexadecene and R method give quite high relaxivity. The four nanometer one is R method, the seven nanometer one is hexadecene method. So in conclude, in summary, there's no one single parameter on which the size and shape of the particle depend on, but it's uh, an interplay of different factors, different, fac different factors, and which is mainly dominated by the choice of precursor and solvent. So depending on whatever application you want to use, you should carefully choose the, the, the precursor and solvent. And although stirring speed is generally ignored in these reactions, it could be one of the important factors which is, gen, which is generally ignored in the papers. And hexadecene and diphenyl ether are more reliable solvents compared to other solvents that we used. And our proposed modification can also be used in other in synthesis of other nanoparticles, which follow the similar mechanism of synthesis. With that, I would like to thank the funding agencies and Bionan, without which this research would not be possible, and Dr. Beat and Klinan for giving me this opportunity to present my work. And any questions?
questions, advices, or constructive criticism is more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for this talk now. This is the last talk of our session. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, please announce them in the chat or you can, since we are a closed group, you can also, you can also mention this um, by the microphone. So may I start with one, Vladimir, I would like to ask you this very interesting data concerning the biopsy of the part uh, of um, virtual biopsy. Um, how do you, what kind of MRI scans are you using? 1.5, 3 Tesla or 7 Tesla? Maybe I missed this information. Oh, sorry. Uh, we are using, um, for the animals, I believe uh, it's a 3 uh, Tesla MRI, uh, uh, but then um, for patients, we usually use like a 1.5 Tesla. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Very good. Okay. I have a question for you, Krista. Yeah. Um, it was more about the, the application uh, to the patient of the magnet. Now you're saying that uh, there's possibly a robot, but the, I was always wondering what was the field that will be needed and the amount of iron, because we see a lot of nanoparticles or liposome or immersion with a full content of iron. Do you, you have uh, uh, know the amount which would be needed and uh, what would be applicable? Absolutely correct. So the point is now the robot, um, it's just uh, to manipulate or to, to move it very precisely. We have the field strength is one Tesla field strength at the tip of the pole shoe and 72 Tesla per meter is a gradient. So this is the amount of the magnetic application and the amount of particles we are using at the moment, we are applying these particles in animals and the amount is between two to three millimeters, uh, milliliters. Um, uh, I am, uh, um, um, and uh, I think in human beings, potentially we will have the amount of our, when we have the license to do this, about 10 milliliters. And the iron content is seven microgram iron per milliliter. Okay. So are there other questions from the audience? Maybe I have a general question to everybody. Do you think that we have a change in the rules for doing research concerning to this pandemia we have at the moment? Because in Germany, it's very funny because we have, if you do apply for animal hmm, studies, usually six to eight months is now the duration for getting permission to do animal studies. And uh, people who are dealing with uh, COVID, Corona, it takes four days in Germany at the moment. So do we have any change in the regulatory concerning new studies also in your field? It's beside nanomedicine, the general question. I guess I can answer. Uh, in the US, they predominantly just uh, limit the amount of personnel that could be in any one facility at a time. So that <clears throat> kind of yeah. has to slow everything down. We have to maintain about two meters distance. Uh, between everyone and uh, everyone now wears masks. But as far as uh, significant, I think just generally everything slowed down, but no specific time increase. So in uh, in Zurich, it's the same. I don't know if it's in, in if this uh, is the same for entire Switzerland. We have really within uh, a couple of days, you get the permit for animal research, but also for uh, clinical research. So we started with a COVID study, a, a clinical study. So <laughs> I think it took us half a week for the ethic committee and then for Swiss Medic, the, the, this is the FDA. And uh, this was really uh, surprising. Uh, I think it has also a general effect in terms that we can speed up now a little bit. Um, of course, we have to guarantee, or these authorities have to guarantee the quality. But I think it was also a good incentive, you know, to think about the, the processes. And normally, it's just because uh, a delay because you know you don't have enough meetings. Or uh, and we learned, I think, with with the virtual meetings that we can really also um, come together as a committee, uh, pursue more teams or. 
that's my observation. I don't know if other, others can share it. Interesting. Yeah. In Italy, in Italy, I must say it's the more or less the same experience. I mean, uh, probably um, uh, she is right. Some uh, processes are speeding up because we are learning how to make them digital, but uh, others uh, are delayed. I mean, uh, uh, our uh, um, research activity is not stopping, but anyway, you need to respect some more rules. And uh, so, so I would say some activity will be speeding up, will be speed up and other not. So, I mean, it's an average. Mm. But nanomedicine can make a, a difference in that, for sure, in the future. So, <laughs> so are there any questions from you? So I don't have any chat at the moment. I don't see if there's any questions. So if you don't have any questions, yeah, I can ask a question to Vladimir. Of course, of course. Of course. Um, Vladimir, uh, I wanted to ask you, well, first it was more semantic question. I was uh, wondering about virtual biopsy. For me, it's a diagnostic agent by MRI. I was not sure about the, the, the semantic. And the second question was more about the polymer. Is the polymalic acid already studied or accepted or uh, is, uh, are there safety knowledge? Um, you know, we have very good safety uh, knowledge. We've done uh, toxicity studies on um, just the general drug for the therapeutics in other presentations that we have uh, detailed a little bit more. Uh, we tried uh, the pyrogenic testing. We've tried, um, we saw that it's, it's completely biodegradable, uh, intracellular with good renal excretion. We have good, bi uh, all the pharmacokinetic uh, data available for it. Um, we are kind of in uh, trying to do primate studies and then uh, move to uh, human clinical trials in the process do that. Oh, and um, I apologize, I made a mistake. It's um, for the animal MRI, it's a 9.4 Tesla. I apologize to answer your question. Yeah, sorry. Um, and the patient MRIs were 1.5 and now moving to three Tesla in the hospital. Um, so I hope I answered everyone's questions. Any others? So are there any questions at the moment? I don't have a chat, no question at the moment. So. If you don't have any very urgent questions at the moment, I think, thank you very much. It was a really exciting session, a little bit different to the normal clinic. I hope that we'll see us next year or in the next future, hopefully, in Basel, in real, and uh, we can communicate also by a glass of water or wine, whatever. <laughs> so I think everybody, thank you very much. It was a really interesting session. I learned a lot. And um, stay healthy and um, have a good time. <laughs>